Exercise foresight, poor eyesight, couldn't fist fight, had to overcompensate. Learn to be clairvoyant, see around corners, read signals and warnings, interpret omens, respond to broadcast from later. Uda Vera, Macy Shu, Valdez Silens, Robert Bolton, and today we are joined by Rada Mystery, a foresight practitioner within Autodesk's office of the CTO. A weak signal of change is an event, idea, issue, or something that we notice popping into the peripheries of our radar, something we notice that we don't really understand yet, but we suspect it could indicate that a significant shift is underway. On broadcast from later, we share, discuss, disentangle, speculate, make bad jokes about the weak signals of change emerging live from the hyper present and try to get a hold on the nowness of later. So, Udit, what's your weakest signal? Okay, so my weakest signal today is about uh, time based currencies. So, just a couple of days ago, I've, I stumbled upon this website called believe.com, which is the tagline is you can live experiences and share your skills using time as the only currency. And since then, there's been a number of time-based currency articles that have popped up in my feed. So one example of that is uh, there's a video that was put out by the British Museum last week on time-based currencies. And then there was another article this week by this software engineer titled Time is the Only Currency. Um, and time-based currencies, if you, know, if, you, if you don't know what they are, the core tenant of a time-based currency is that time is a scarce resource and that everyone's time should be valued equally. So one hour of my time would be equal to one hour of you know, your time. And that forms uh, the basis of any kind of exchange. So if I do one hour of labor for you, you give me back one hour of time dollars or whatever we want to call them. Uh, and I can save that time and use it to buy other sort of products or services. But the other thing is you can't invest or speculate with the time, right? So like you have to spend it and exchange it for other people's time. Mm -hmm. um, so like you won't have this sort of, these sort of market bubbles that happen in the normal economy that we've come to find problematic. Obviously, time-based currencies uh, are not that new. Like a lot of people have been talking about them. You probably are aware of a lot of time-based currency projects over time. It's got uh, its roots in um, the labor theory of value. And there are a number of projects in the last few years that I was, I've been thinking about that are related to time-based currency. So in the context of the attention economy, there, you know, there's a bunch of blockchain projects uh, that are trying to tokenize time, uh, the most notable of which is um, the basic attention token. Uh, you know, which I think we've talked a lot about in the past in week six signal scanning. But it seems like people have been talking about time-based currencies again during this quarantine, and I've been thinking about why. And maybe the obvious reason is that people just have a lot of time and not as much money anymore, you know, when they're stuck at home. But also it feels like, you know, there is like this time-based informal economy exchange going on with like care mongering and mutual aid projects that we're seeing. Uh, and so people are performing little acts of labor, like, you know, picking up groceries for your neighbor or cooking or caring for somebody's garden or, or what have you. And I wonder if this is like a weak signal of the way we think of, about how we're spending our time and if there are other ways of incorporating the value of time in the work that we do. And so I guess that's my weak signal. What do you guys think? Does it account for the theory of relativity? Like if I'm moving at light speed, is an hour of my time equal to an hour of yours? <laughs> no, it doesn't, I guess. Yeah. And like, I guess like this is another point, which is like, is time actually a scarce resource, right? Like I might live for a different amount of time than you might. And like, you know, life expectancy in different parts of the world are different. So, and, you know, we, you know in the future, we might be living, living for longer and longer amounts of time. So how do you account for that? There's a bunch of questions there. I don't know. It also like, questions social dynamics and things like the caste system in certain economies by way of what family or community you're born into your time is less or more valuable than somebody else's and so there's this entire like cultural component that i think would have to be like layered onto that right for it to be more widely adopted and so like i wonder how something like this concept of the currency of time would be seen depending on cultural context yeah, so people have like talked about time exchanges as well. So like if there are different kind of geographies where time is valued differently, you can have like an exchange in the same way that you have like a US dollar to rupee exchange, Indian rupee exchange. You could have like a Canadian time dollar to can Indian time system exchange as well, right? IST to <laughs> Eastern <Yeah>. Standard Time. <laughs> There's also like states that have experimented with it. Like the USSR had a time currency for certain things. I know this because I presented it and somebody got really pissed off at me uh, for for like bringing up the memory of, of like being forced to kind of like be part of this like time extraction state 
where it was like, because you, you had to work every Saturday uh, uh, was one of the things in USSR. I know it's been trialed in Ithaca, New York, where they have, I think they call it Ithaca dollars or Ithaca credits or something. And you can exchange like one hour of somebody's time in Ithaca, in the grocery store for one hour of labor that was used to produce a product or whatever it is. Has anyone used it? I've never used one. I've always thought it was an interesting idea, but I've never like actually done it. No. Like as an exchange time for someone else's time, like even informally? I think you, you would have to have a currency for it to count. It would have to be recorded somehow and expect it to be reciprocated. Could you exchange like time for space? Like, cause I'm thinking back to, I don't know, like five or six years ago where you had all of these like cafes where you could kind of buy your time in that cafe per hour or per minute or something. Mm -hmm. And so if it's not a people to people kind of exchange, what other kind of services or products would you be able to exchange? And like, how do you start to value between those two things? Right. So, I mean, like the labor theory of value is that the value of the product is determined by the amount of social labor that went into producing that product, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how you would value it. Now, space is an interesting question because you can argue that space isn't a product of labor, yeah. right? And space is also energy. Like energy might not also be a product of labor, right? Like we're getting solar energy that's not coming from someone's labor. And then there are like finite, like natural resources as well. And I think there's like a, the different ways that people have talked about how to like value these things. I don't know. Like, I think there's just different ways that people try to like map on labor to other forms of scarce resources. I imagine it works really well for services, but I imagine it falls apart with products because it's like the labor theory of value doesn't make any sense in the context of high technology manufacturing and stuff like that, where the amount of hours just becomes incalculable. It doesn't really make sense or something for a given like product because of like the amount of knowledge and stuff embedded into it. How do you count those hours? That's like one of the main critiques that I think people have of time-based currencies is that how you count for different amounts of scale, right? Like in our current economy, my, the time that I spend doing something might be valued differently from the time that somebody else does because, you know, the amount of scale that's required, that I built up over time is different from the, the amount of scale that somebody else has acquired. But like my argument to that is like, I don't really know if we like value our skills very well, like in the current economy, right? Like if you look at what's happening in COVID, all these essential sort of grocery store workers, clearly we're finding that they're essential and like they're not, you know, the best paid. I just wonder if like the system that we have right now is good enough also. What a risk-based currency then? The amount of risk in the role that you're doing at a given time. Yeah, How do you oh, calculate that though? Or like who determines that? I don't know, but you could generally figure out right now that someone uh, sure, working insurance in, companies. Yeah, insurance. Yeah, they do it. People, people calculate it. There's a kind of tables. Yeah, but the person, you know, checking groceries or whatever is clearly taking more risks than uh, we are sitting around here, you know, making podcasts, exchanging mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. So, like, that's in some ways, it's just obvious who should be here anymore. But I wonder if it makes economy, like, if, if, say, something like this was more widely adopted, does it then imply that economies become more insular? Because it's way easier to exchange time in your own community, which is like not a new model, right? Like this concept of like, let me help you build your barn and you help me like, I don't know, milk my cows or some shit like that. I don't know why a farm reference came to my mind, but like, does it then mean that like, it's just easier to stay within your own community and to exchange skills and time within your own community? And in a world where you're starting to see, at least like I'm starting to see a lot more things happening more effectively at the grassroots level and in local governments and in local economies, does something like this find its footing in this kind of landscape where it's just like, let's look inward and kind of take care of ourselves. Yeah, and there's also like the element of trust. And so I guess it goes into how, how, how are these transactions documented or recorded? And then how, how might trust play a role in that? Yeah, you can imagine I, all sorts of like national scale, like trading hours of your nation internationally with others and like negotiating and basically breaking the rule of one hour for one hour, I'm assuming, where mm. um, like, perversions of the concept I could see emerging. Yeah. Based on like what you heard in Soviet Russia? Uh, no, no, just <laughs> based on like existing inequalities and stuff like that, you know? Right. And yeah. who's churning out those hours for the countries to work? And like, is there, a, is there like a scale or a threshold to which like this loses its, its novelty and like purity of form? Mm -hmm. You know, like if you start to kind of venture into international economies and all of a sudden my time is not the same as your time yeah then it's money right yeah i think rather what you're mm -hmm. saying about it being functional at sort of these neighborly and local scales is probably true 
Uh, and I wonder if that's why we're sort of seeing a research. And that was like the idea that, it, that you know, kind of started this thought for me as a weak signal is that I feel like people are talking about it right now because of all the mutual aid work that's going on. And they are actually, there is this informal time exchange economy happening and being created. Right. It also ties in with like the element of care, right? Because it's like, I'm spending the time for you yeah, yeah. as opposed to like, I'm just giving you money. Yeah. The only thing against the local thing is that the most successful time currency so far is the, I forget how you say it, Fudai Kipu or something, the oh, right. Japanese one. And that one works because it's at a national scale and it's because people had to move across Japan away from their families and there's a stronger sense of being responsible for your family. It's actually like in law, you're technically responsible for your elders mm -hmm. in a way that you're not here to take care yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. And that, that movement of people across the country was what made it possible. How would an old person think time? Yeah, do you know do you know how it works, Valdis? Can you explain how it works a little bit more? I don't I don't know what the model is. As far as I understand it, it might have been expanded, but it was like for taking care of your parents, that was the main use case. So people would because they moved away, they couldn't do it. So they traded with other families mm. who had like parents or what like other people's parents nearby to take care of them. So it wasn't the old people working, it was like younger families and stuff, putting in like four hours a week, taking care of somebody else's parent, basically. So I wonder then, if like, like the reason why it scales up in Japan is because the values and like what's considered important are, is just like it exists at a wider scale. It's like the same values that like exist at a wider scale. So you don't need the local context anymore because the values are the same in yeah. a broader region. And it's also not very skilled work. So you don't have, you know, that problem never comes up. The resentments right. and stuff that people probably harbor. Right. So what do you guys think, signal or noise? It brings up a lot of good questions. I feel like it could make a lot of sense as like a secondary economy or like a parallel economy at certain scales and certain like locations, certain uses for like things where it's easier to find the equivalent, uh, the equivalent hour for hour kind of trade. Trade. Seems like it breaks like at a certain point. And, and I'm trying to figure out whether like where it breaks, it starts to signal like a lot of points about just how we value different types of work and whether uh, those values actually make good sense, sense or not. Yeah, in some cases they probably do, in some cases they don't, or in some cases certainly the disparity is just way too high is the main point, right? The fact that it's emerging right now seems like a, a signal of something. I, I, I do question though from like a signal perspective, is this a signal that could actually like challenge the status quo in any significant way? Does anyone think? I don't think so, personally. I think it's gonna shift what we already do uh, maybe to account for some of the ideas that this kind of scheme has, which is like like finding new ways of valuing work that might not be highly skilled. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what it is. That's the signal is that we're thinking about new ways to value work and yeah. that we should value real work more than we maybe do. Yeah. And, and I think there's something about expertise here and maybe that it's overvalued in some places. It's really hard to say that though, you know, there's yeah. a lot of people doing work that requires a lot of expertise right now that like are probably you know paid very well for it and that work is probably also saving a lot of people's lives and things like yeah. that right? i'm talking about people who aren't on the front lines and so on like the people creating vaccines and epidemiologists and yeah or even people within government who are creating policies and communicating to people and that kind of thing what do the rest of you guys think uh, i would just say the same that you guys said like i think it's true that the it functions as a signal at the level of like the crisis of value that a lot of people mm -hmm. talk about coming at economics from the outside of the discipline and the question of like how valorization, the sort of process of attributing value to something and what that value counts as. And then I guess I would add that maybe there's just like easy technologies and databases and stuff to make the counting of hours a little simpler than it used to be, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that makes it a little different than it might have been 100 years ago when you just bartered like, uh, you know, an hour of cow's milk for an hour of cheese making or whatever. Like it could be formalized in a way, standardized in a way. Yeah. And there might be cool things you could do with that, ways of like trading and dicing it up and, you know, putting these, I don't know, creating all sorts of weird object, time-based like objects that you mm -hmm. could trade. Yeah, maybe it would change like our product because how we're saying it's hard to evaluate products as opposed to mm -hmm. services. So perhaps the things that we consume will change yeah. it all into like a time-based scale or something like that. I think there's something here about the experience of time and that something just that's just horrible drudgery work that you hate doing might seem to pass very slowly, for example. And the fact is probably that most of the time that work 
not entirely, but there's probably a lot of instances where that work is undervalued relative to work that people love doing that are like sort of happy birds living their like dream job out as far as their hours spent. Mm-hmm. And so like there's something that maybe seems a bit backward about that. But I wonder about the sort of sense experience of time passing and, and this the sense of duration of a given sort of carved out block of time, uh, how that could affect us as well. Yeah. And I talk, talk a lot about scaling. And I think this like idea of scaling is a very potentially like a Western concept. But there's this notion of like, at what scale does an economic system or a value system just become ineffective? Mm-hmm. And I think we're starting to see that in a lot of our current economic systems, right? Where like, it's just gotten too big. And so, yeah, I don't know if this is signal or noise, but it just definitely raises a lot of interesting questions, which I think is useful in itself. Macy, do you mm-hmm. think signal or noise? I'm just in agreement with everyone. I think, I think it's signaling certain things are happening within our situation right now. But again, I think it's probably can only be applied to certain use cases and at a certain point it just it, i don't know if it will overtake the status quo okay well it sounds like everyone agrees that it's a sort of a signal of the like crisis of value not a signal of something that's going to replace existing currencies about this what's your weakest signal so i've been thinking about this friend group of mine that's using like ham radios to run a reading group and i'm just like I can't find anybody else who's like doing this anywhere. So hopefully it's like proper signal territory. It doesn't take that much like technical expertise to set it up, but it just takes like a number of like added extra steps to go about doing this as opposed to just using Zoom or any given platform. And the reason they're using it is for privacy concerns. But I could also imagine this like relating to broader issues around like uh, Wait, what, what books are they reading? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for the specific content of anything that's being discussed it's like for the principle of the political statement of it in the sense yeah. of a fashion statement exactly i mean the u.s army kind of thinks like this too like as soon as you create a digital system there's an attack surface and there's vulnerabilities and mm. like it doesn't matter what you do that system will never be fully safe and so like to take those systems offline is like the best thing to do but yeah i was saying that i think there's also like another aspect to this which is like it's coming at a time when there's a lot of discussion around optimization versus resilience inside mm-hmm. of systems. And I had talked to you guys earlier about like the question of, actually I think Rob, you brought it up, like what's the given communications technology that will still exist like if the internet goes down and it was ham radio that was the one that was brought up. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, that question of a system that's resilient to all sorts of disruptions, like turns out the internet might not be that resilient. <laughs> It's interesting that you talked about this in the context of privacy, though, because as far as I understand it, Ham, like you have to, your, your messages have to be in the clear. In fact, there was, I think there was like a movement to do like um, packet radio through Ham as well, which was like basically like digital hmm. and not analog signals over Ham, but like it was shut down because people like the Ham community wanted everything to be in the clear. So in fact, you can list, if you know someone's Ham, I forget what it's called, I think it's called an air sign, I could be wrong, but like you're you're basically your handle on ham, like you can like pick up other people's uh, communication. There's a really famous story about someone on the ISS, like listening into like this communication that was happening between two people on earth through, through the ham channel and like that being their connection to like the world or something. It's a really interesting, beautiful story. But um, mm-hmm. I'm just like wondering if like privacy is even a thing on ham, like how, is, how in way is it private? I think that's interesting because I think it is probably private in the sense of not having like extractive agents, basically like uh, corporate ones uh, going for your data in any sort of way. And it's just like a sort of sense that you have as you communicate. Certainly if you're sending emails, you might feel that it's unlikely that someone's about to be be reading it or whatever, but you're very certain that Google's harvesting Mm -hmm. data from it. So given that they're coming on principle, it might be that sort of that sort so of free of surveillance capital and capitalism as opposed to privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that sort of where they're coming from or what it, about this or what do you think is their take on? Yeah, they're not like the crypto, an, they're not crypto anarchists who like think that privacy is like a be all end all, right. uh, the principle in and of itself, an end to be like achieved. It's, it's like what Rob was saying, like the political economy of the infrastructure of the internet is such that it is being monitored both at a corporate level and a governmental level. And so that could happen to ham radio at some point, but as far as I know, it's not happening right now. So how many yes. people are in this reading group? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's like 10 to 20. I'm not sure. Hey, we should start an ad recommendation company based on ham, what we are listening to on ham radio. Yeah. <laughs> Just 
a ham trend, uh, a weekly ham trend in keywords. <laughs> <laughs> How difficult is it to set up the ham radio? Yeah. Sure. I actually don't know. I think, I think Udin maybe might know. I, I don't know. I've looked into getting my ham license in Toronto. So like the thing that's holding me back from getting it is you need to learn Morse code. There's a Morse code, ex there's a Morse code oh. ex as part of the ham radio license. You could probably learn that in like a That's a good day. skill. Yeah, how, many, how much Morse code do you need to know? This is a task you have to learn. Like, you have to like, be able to convert English to Morse code and vice versa in a certain amount of time. Um, you could. And then there's like, a technical test as well. You need to know like, basic radio theory uh, and antenna theory, I think. But I think it's like, fairly basic. It's not like, very advanced, which I think will be OK. Yeah. You could Are reverse, there... uh, reverse yeah. engineer the, the Morse code because it's based on how frequent the letters, the letters are. are right so the more frequent the shorter it is so you could try to guess you know yeah i can draw little histograms on <laughs> in my margins <laughs> yeah right. cheat um, the system are there any geographic limits to it like in terms of how far reaching the signals can go i think so but it sounds like somebody was listening in from space so i don't know yeah well but that was that fiction no no that's real, that's real? it's a real story yeah but i want to look this up now because i remember it from a long time ago Hey man, you got time to pick up more skills. We're all quarantined. <laughs> yeah. Why not Morse code? I'm just gonna speak in Morse code from now on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna annoy all my neighbors just tapping on walls. <laughs> I listened to about an hour of regular FM radio this morning as I was waking up, and that's kind of become like a new habit for me. And I, I like it a lot. It kind of it puts me at ease, which is maybe a nostalgia memory thing of like that CBC radio being played in the kitchen, like over breakfast cereal or something growing up. But I also find it super informative. Like it kind of quickly like gets me all the news and stuff that I need to get. And I think what I like about it is the single function aspect where it's like, obviously I can get this information on my phone, but on my phone, there's so much choice and so much optionality and there's sort of that, but I'm not spending a bunch of time. I'm just going to the same CBC radio every morning, finding out what I need. I know when to turn it on to hear the prime minister give his address and so on. It works pretty well. On that experience, like, is it a little bit different also because you kind of have to be a captive audience? Like with, a, for example, say you've got a podcast on your phone, right? Mm. You can rewind and pause and then fast forward and like, it's, it's always there. But there's this thing of like, whatever's on the radio is fleeting. Right? And like you've either captured or you don't. Yeah, yeah. I like that though, because it's like, you know, often yeah. I just don't catch it. I go and do something else and, <laughs> I, you know, I miss some of it. It's just like uh, the passing of time. Yeah. But also they repeat the same things over and over again on the radio too. <laughs> for that reason, because everyone's getting <laughs> their cars at a different moment or whatever. Yeah. So they hear about the story that's coming up in an hour, then you hear <laughs> about it, then you hear it, and then, you know, then they recap it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to get the information. But it's, it's also good. live, right? Yeah. At a time, a lot of it is like yeah. a, as you know, it's a thing. Live streaming is like the media form in video that's popular right now, also. So there's like, there's that aspect as well. Yeah. And it's a nice medium that's like, it has its own quality. It's not, the sound isn't, you know, as good as like a really crisp, well produced podcast, but mm -hmm. it's got its own kind of quality that works. So signaling noise, would it? <laughs> I think it's noise because I don't, I don't really know what it's signaling. Is it signaling building alternative communication infrastructure? Because I feel like that's been happening already in other spaces and the strongest signals outside of this. It signals that the internet is over, man. That's what it signals. It's oh, done. The internet's broken. Yeah. Internet's broken. <laughs> Just get off and leave. That's the answer. <laughs> I see it as kind of a signal of like, yeah, the, the cozy dial or the something like that, whatever you want to call it, is it the equivalent of the cozy web. This kind of like small groups coming together. You're not lo actually looking to reach beyond the group of people that you're connected with in your own kind of community. It's more about building like closeness with a smaller group and your broadcast. Oh, micro networks. Yeah. Uh, and hyper local. Trying to go super viral and catch everyone that tends to be like shallower things that do that. Right. Uh, Valdis, where are these people located? In Germany. Rural or urban? Urban, I think, but might, might be across like a few locations what was not, their motivation for doing this the being unable to like trust the infrastructure to not be monitoring and just not wanting to participate and living up to like the claims that they make as like artists and thinkers and like walking the walk of their critiques mm. so was this pre this was pre-covid then no it's during it i think yeah it's been in the last like I few months started it in the last few months yeah yeah 
I don't even know if it's happened yet. I just know it was. They're setting yeah. it up this whole time. Yeah. Rada, what do you think? Signal and noise. Again, I think it's something towards a bigger signal, which is this like hyper localization of just community and kind of people starting to opt out of the global realm. Mm. But if we're talking about kind of surveillance capitalism or privacy, then I think it's noise. Mm. Macy? I think it's a signal for, again, like the hyper local network stuff and just people valuing more um, genuine connection, I think, and not be distracted by other noises. Father, do you have a strong point of view that it's a that it's a signal, or you're not, are you kind of bringing it in? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Okay. I, it's like any <laughs> it's like any signal. It just depends on how you slice and dice it. Like mm -hmm. the, the funny thing about the word signal is, you think it issues from the thing, but it issues from the receiver who's, who's mm. catching it. You know. So yeah. Cool. Okay, Macy, what's your weakest signal? I've been trying to brush up on my Chinese with my mom. Hmm. Lately, so I was reading about a new programming language called Wenyin Lang that hmm. is based on Chinese Hanzi characters and the Wenyin classical Chinese grammar system. So hmm. what this developer did is he applied natural language processing techniques to convert classical Chinese grammar into JavaScript and Python and Ruby, um, and he's open sourced it as a project. And a lot of there's there's been a lot of uptick in creating um, different programs. What interests me about it is that so Chinese the Chinese language the characters are not phonetic. There's no alphabet, and each is like each character has meaning on its own. Hmm. So I'm sure Udit or Valdis, you'll know more about about it in terms of programming logic and stuff like that. But it has to be like parsed through multiple letters, whether um, it might be designed to eliminate a lot of parsings because um, the Chinese character itself is like a meaning token on its own. Mm. And also it's just interesting to see computer science being more localized into Chinese culture because a lot of programming languages is all, you know, English language based. Yeah, I think that's, that's just kind of a random interesting thing. That's, um, it was just created like a month ago. And I'm surprised actually that it hasn't already existed before. Like how did it work? Did they take an existing programming language and take the sort of like structure and syntax and just like literally translate those? Or is there like a new sort of like programming paradigm that's emerging from a Chinese sense of representation of my understanding content. is like it's a kind of new paradigm although i think i think he's still trying to convert it in what is it it's called, called wen yang lang right so is there like a wen yang python or is it just wen yang i'm not sure but my hope is that it's just like a completely new programming paradigm and that's right. a signal <laughs> yeah 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 interesting yeah i'm so, super interested in learning more about it <laughs> I, there's too much too many things i don't know anything about here for me to yeah. learn, exactly <laughs> very much yeah. What What are people saying as far as like are there people yet reading into the meaning of this or this sort of like cultural significance or technical significance or? I mean, obviously, you'll have to know Chinese and Chinese grammar to be able to use it. So mm -hmm. the application of it is limited to that. But they're trying to create a community around the language, and they're making it completely open source, and they're creating like a manual for use, and also sourcing different code snippets that people can use to create their own programs. So I think there's a lot of uptick and I think the impetus behind it is kind of to try and push programming language beyond the limits of language itself. And for sure, I think culturally there is that significance in maintaining and keeping Chinese language, especially it's taking like classical grammar. So it's something that's like preserving that traditional knowledge in a kind of updated digital way. And how does the classical grammar work in a different way than the contemporary grammar? Um, I guess you can like kind of liken it to like, old English. Um, Does but, someone maintain it? Um, yeah, there's like lots of texts and stuff that you can read into to learn the classical Chinese grammar. And I think with Chinese language, I think there's like an intuitive way of reading it that is more about visual and sensorial as opposed to, whereas I, I think English is more, there's like a more representational layer. Well, you know what I'm trying graphic. to say? It's pictographic, it's sort of... So, yeah, so I'm also wondering whether it's like indicating new ways of communicating that's like much more in tune with how how humans perceive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was like my first instinct about it was this like fanoplia thing that is partly what makes 
I don't know, Chinese characters so rich and so difficult to learn all of them, like they are pictographic in nature and sort of like have a different relationship with senses than a language like English does that's so much more phonetic or like sonically oriented in terms of how meaning is conveyed. And I think there has been, you know, discussion about even could, you know, just like the characters itself be used to indicate other languages because the characters are meaning based. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of just sort of machine learning language processing fun to be had sort of vaguely within this whole space. That seems like a signal. Machine learning can't handle it, man. None of that stuff is digitized yet in the ways. I mean, the history of, of Chinese characters in communication technology in general is like interesting. And like the typewriter was already an issue back right. in the day. And there was like lots of debates about modernizing the language in the sense of yeah, the stuff you guys have been talking about, like making, I don't know, I don't know what the different tiers of like language are now, like opinion version, like yeah. something that has like a romanized <laughs> um, phonetic representation or something like that. But like from the very start, it was like an issue inside of, of Chinese culture. And apparently there was like some very like strong, like Chinese communist advocates of like making very rational, modernized, clean language. I think I, I just looked at the GitHub project page and I think I understand a little bit more about what they do, mm -hmm. which is, it's actually way more interesting than I thought because it's like, you write in classical Chinese grammar mm -hmm. and then it uses NLP to take this classical writing into, you can like compile it into sort of, like I don't know if compile is the right word, but like translate it into Western programming languages like Python or JavaScript or so. Mm -hmm. You don't, you're not actually writing in JavaScript, you're writing it in- The uh, in classical the, Chinese. In classical Chinese. Yeah. And so it's interesting to me because like there's this, you know, if you look at the history of programming languages, you're seeing that we're getting to higher and higher levels of abstraction, right? Like we started from like very low level machine code to languages that are, you know, have started to resemble more and more like how we talk and how we speak and how we communicate among humans. And this is like, in some way, like the next evolution of that, right? It's like, you know, we're getting to a point where we're being able to write in these sort of like localized classical forms, and then they get compiled into these low level languages, which are JavaScript and Python, which no one would call low level languages right now, right? Like in contemporary uh, computer science discourse, they're considered very high level languages because you can have these higher level representations of ideas, but this is an even higher level. So we talk a lot about like generative design and then also just like programming like robotics for construction and things like that. And one of the biggest things in generative design right now is because of who is coding the algorithms and like how we are establishing the systems, everything that comes out of a generative design workflow looks the same aesthetically. Mm -hmm. And the thing we have to start to get over is like, how do you start to build in regional cultural context, right? And like design for that in the same way that we have like different kind of rituals and behaviors and like the robots that we're working with. And so I wonder if something like this starts to kind of create a mind shift where mm. it's actually kind of in some way able to absorb these like disparate cultural norms at a fundamental part of coding into the design system or the design process. The theme of the day. Yeah, so hyper, yeah, hyper, yeah, hyper local economy, <laughs> hyper local <laughs> communication, hyper local code, hyper yeah. local design. <laughs> I think we all miss being hyper local with our friends. What's, so. a hyper, what's the difference between local and hyper local? That's a great point. <laughs> hyper because it's, because it's code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to echo like Rada's point, I was like thinking, I mean, it's so speculative and, and dumb probably from a computer science perspective, but like, could it like signal any kind of like post Boolean logic or something like that, which is like the most fundamental layer at which like programming languages make sense or operate? just because I had read this book called The Book of Beginnings that looks at, it looks at a few different sentences from a few cultures. It looks like at the Iliad, it looks at the Hebrew Bible, and then it looks at uh, some classical Chinese text, The Book of Changes, I think. And then it analyzes the first sentence in each book to show how it has like a fundamentally different like operating logic that sets up so many down the line, like third, fourth order effects of how you go about perceiving the world. Because like the structure of your objects and your subjects and your predicates and your adverbs and all that stuff is like so radically different in each of these languages. And there's a The lot one thing that I would say about that, Valdis, is that this is a project that's starting from the top of the stack, not the bottom, right? Like it's starting from, yeah, like, yeah, I know it considers it's like, like JavaScript and Python is canonical and then built on top of that, as opposed to like- No, it's not going yet. at the root of, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
that it just it's a diving board for imagining those other things mm -hmm. you know it's not what that project's doing but you could imagine others trying maybe the fact that nlp was used to compile between these different languages is like that in itself is like a signal to me it's like there's a lot of what's called technical debt that's built up when you know you decide to go down a certain technical path working on a project and you have your entire project in like fortran or whatever c in the past and like you, this, it's so hard to switch to a new programming paradigm because like you've you know you have like le all this legacy code over time and the fact is that they're using nlp to com to like move from one type of programming language to another like i wonder if this this is like a signal of in the future we can like just like snap of a button and switch from like one code base to a completely different code base so it like eliminates all the legacy effects that you know technology projects have the, the end of refactoring at the end of like migration i would say like you know like mm. migration mm -hmm. is like a big problem for lots of projects and like the amount of time it takes to move from one system to another and for organizations and institutions too like yeah shifting systems completely mm -hmm. interesting so is that signal for you Udit? i think it is a signal for me yeah Rada? i think it's a signal about this i abstain <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't think i'm like i don't get i don't i'm not my receiver isn't strong enough to determine whether or not it's a signal or noise. I see. I think it's a signal. That's why I brought it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a signal that I need to learn more about this stuff for me. Uh, Rada, what's your weakest yeah. signal? Okay. This might be noise, but whatever. So like a few different things have happened this week. I don't know. Is it Thursday already? I don't know. But I, <laughs> one was I've been... <laughs> um, I was an advisor for this guy's thesis on like mobility and futures thinking and he just had his defense yesterday so like mobility has been on my mind and then I've also been just lately kind of obsessed with material sciences and like materials of the future and how we think about construction and those two things merged in this really weird way where there's this it's not super new but I've not been able to find that much about it and I don't know why maybe you guys can tell me it's this bionic light activated stingray mm -hmm. and it was developed at Harvard actually um, but it's basically this like 16 millimeter bionic stingray and the way they constructed it is super cool so they basically took this thin gold skeleton that's sandwiched between two layers of stretchy polymer that's kind of supposed to simulate stingray skin and then they took heart muscles that they ha harvested from, from rat embryos and then layered it onto the artificial vertebrae in a zigzag form. So it kind of creates this kinetic form almost. And they embedded these light activated proteins within that. So essentially when this thing becomes like fully formed, you can control it and like have it move through water by using light as a signaling mechanism. Because basically what happens is the algae that are embedded in the muscles, the heart muscles that they've now attached to a vertebrae, they like expand and contract. And so it like propels this little thing along. But like there's been a lot, you know, if you think about the last few years, there was like Mercedes Benz did that biome car where they were thinking about like how, what if we grew vehicles? And like six or seven years ago, there was this other like algae powered car that was this proposal that came out of Tom Wiscombe's studio back in LA. So we've had this, there's been this thing around wanting to mix like material sciences and mobility systems in some way. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, this thing moves like super slow though. It moves at like 1.5 millimeters per second or something, I think is what they said. Is the light used for signaling or is the light used to, like, is that the energy source? That's, yeah, so it's used for, it's used for signaling. So basically there's light activated like algae that are embedded mm -hmm. into the muscles that are on the vertebrae of this bionic stingray and mm -hmm. they respond to the light. So like as you move the light forward, it makes the muscles like contract and like basically spaz and like right. propels it <laughs> forward. It's a super weird little looking thing, but it just made me think like we talked a lot about mobility on land, mm -hmm. but there are so many issues with deep sea exploration and like finding vehicles that work underwater and that are agile and that are, you know, things like that. So like, I'm just curious about different forms of moving around and like different forms of like energy and it's, it's made from a real stingray skeleton that's the no so it's totally bionic they've used okay. a polymer to like stimulate the skin and then the skeletal system is made out of gold and then they've used cells from heart cells from a rat embryo because that it can pump right it, it, it can move and then embedded that on the vertebrae the gold vertebrae mm -hmm. i know this so, is super weird but this so is so like nice. frank and frank and you know, it's like a mix yeah, of this and really pinch cool that. about it yeah, yeah. is yeah. there a reason why they picked the stingray as the animal to yeah, and why can't it go as fast as a stingray <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's a stingray is fast. It's the hypothesis that I have, because I was like trying to find information on like why, but the hypothesis I have is that it was probably a form that was not as complex as like a fish or some other kind of like marine animal where mm-hmm. you could pick apart. And it's not like a squid where it's like all jelly like, but it had enough mobility in it and like a simple enough vertebrae system to where you could actually augment that in some way and actually like design it in some way. I mean, other than, you know, mobility underwater, they could also learn more about artificial hearts. Yeah, that was one of the things that was like artificial organs, even. Mm -hmm. They had to build 200 models of this thing to actually get it to the point where like the cells would fuse along the vertebrae in just the right sequencing to where when they moved it around with light, it didn't like jerk around and stuff like that. It was just like fluid kind of Mm -hmm. movement. So the light source is external and it's focused like a laser. And then this thing is like in the water and it But that also then begs the question is like, how far down can this thing be below the surface to where like light doesn't hit it effectively anymore or something like that? Do you guys hear of the space elevator project that a lot of people were talking about maybe like a decade ago or so? It was like laser power because like, how do you take all this fuel up to this thing? And like, that's, you know, potentially like, you know, thousands of meters above sea level or above the ground. And so they were talking about using a laser pointer, like a really, really strong laser to like power it. And so you're not actually carrying the energy source with you. You just emit that energy from the ground and then it captures and receives the energy and then actuates the energy to move up. The question of like where the energy source is interesting, because when you guys are talking about the stingray, why a stingray, I just realized its body plan is really weird for an animal because animals optimize essentially for roundness. You're trying to minimize surface area for mm-hmm. like being attacked and being visible and all that stuff. Whereas plants optimize for like a plane, like a flat right. flatness, mm-hmm. maximum surface area. And the question of like how you get self-powered mobility might be with these like really flat long sheets or something like that, you know, that are like powering themselves because they have to maximize the weight to surface area distribution. But I don't know if this thing is powered by, I don't know what, what powers it actually. Things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'd be cool if it was the algae. That'd be very cool. Because, like, getting a mobile thing that's powered by, like, photosynthesis is, like, a cool idea. Yeah, so right now it's, like, proteins derived from algae that respond to light, blue light, specifically. But, like, this is the interesting thing. is like, when I was at ERA, we d- they had done this project in Hamburg where they had the entire facade had algae systems in it. And the algae was meant to kind of capture light and then produce energy for the building. And so this kind of felt like a smaller version of that and thinking a little bit more about algae as a power source. I've seen a lot around like harvesting plant energy to move things lately. Like Mm -hmm. stuff came out of like MIT lab a year ago or something like that. So I feel like there's something brewing Mm -hmm. where how can we use natural systems to power synthetic ones? Isn't oil already natural though? It's like already just just a bunch of trees. Yeah, but that's like fuel versus like an energy mechanism, right? Yeah, yeah. Does algae move on its own? I don't know. That's cyanobacteria. It doesn't count as, it's like a weird little category of its own. They used to think it was algae, but they realized lately that it's not algae. And it's actually a bacteria that has photosynthesis capability. So it's kind of a weird kingdom of its own. Are those the things that like make bodies of water light up or is that different? It's the thing that caused the oxidation event 200 million years ago, but (laughs) I don't know if it glows in the the oceans. I know there's like a huge cyanobacteria like art movement thing where people are painting bacteria. Oh, really? Yeah. There's this image that Lynn Margulis is this, like, the person who did the most work to, like, establish symbiogenesis as, like, a force inside of evolution. And she had this vision of, like, homo photosyntheticus or something, where, like, Mm -hmm. humans would, like, start growing algae on the top of their heads. And one of the consequences was that they would stop having to have mouths because they wouldn't have to eat anymore. They would eventually evolve into these sort of faceless, holeless, Many a biohacker has attempted it. <laughs> to remove their mouths? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> to photosynthesize. To be like a plant. Yeah. And like, how do you express feelings? And, and how, how do you, you eat? eat? How do you enjoy food? How do you enjoy food? It's, it's yeah. not more space. It's, it's not about sustenance, you know. Like, yeah. Or oh, like, no. it's just find like comfort in food. Yeah. Exactly. You want to enjoy photosynthesis. Yeah, Morse code. Yeah. And pictographic <laughs> languages. And do you think different wavelengths uh, like taste different? Like blue versus red? Yeah, blue tastes like pizza. That's what my plans tell me. <laughs> mm, <Yeah. laughs> good to know. <laughs> Radha, what does the signal for you? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a couple different things. One, it's thinking about new types of energy for mobility, honestly, in real life, which I know is, sounds crazy, but true. And then the other thing is like, we talk a lot about new types of materials, but half the problem becomes, are they actually resilient in the environments that we need them in? And so like, you can create like a concrete that's really good for a building, but then 
you put it into an actual building and then it doesn't necessarily work. So being able to kind of like test materials and new ways of, I don't know, new applications like a bionic stingray, something about nature and robotics, bionics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the rat heart piece. Sort of like, <laughs> yeah. I think just putting in bio, like these like biological organ systems and like biological like, pumping mechanisms and like fluidics mechanisms into like the movement of our vehicles is a really cool idea. So I'm gonna well, go with signal for that part. I, was, I asked one of my friends yesterday if like given the choice would he be a bionic human, and he said no. But like I think the image that people have about like what is bionic is so different and oftentimes it moves to like, oh, like I'm gonna be this exoskeleton human form thing. But when we talk about bionic, it's not, it doesn't have to be like an entire appendage or like an entire, you know, skeletal system. It could be, we have taken the heart cells of a rat embryo and attached it to a piece of metal and had that metal act in a different way and like that in itself becomes bionic. And so I just, I love the fact that this was kind of like pushing the bounds of what we mean by bionic and what we mean by living, you know? And I think it starts to, bring up a lot of questions because if you look at like what this thing looks like it freakily looks like a real stingray and like how would i feel seeing that thing swimming around it felt like almost like we were messing a little bit too much with life forms but i liked the kind of sense of i don't know there was like a level of hubris in it i have a question do people know if people are working on cellular agriculture projects for like not for the food benefits but like mechanical properties or for their for like these sorts of projects, which are like useful, like actuation and sensing or things like that. And not like yep. not for food. There's a whole Ingrid Burrington article on like how to grow skin for all the cyborgs that are going to be <laughs> popping up in the next like 50 years. But that, that question like, is how do you make enough just like, yeah. yeah, how do you grow enough skin to cover all these robots? But also like not just covering robots, like covering buildings, covering cars. So it's like bionic yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. The thing about any material that uses that kind of like a protein as its base is that it's going to like stink when it like rots and stuff. It's just going to be like a putrid like garbage dump, you know? <laughs> putrid features. <laughs> yeah, like you'll have to bury a building the way you have to bury a body or burn it or whatever, you know? But maybe that creates like a nice kind of ritual and, you know, sanctity to your yeah, space. I, <laughs> I mean, it's, but it's, no, it's not so far off from like what people are already thinking in construction. Like I was, there was this startup that's basically creating a database of materials and they're think, they're talking about like materials as construction materials as a service. So mm. you, you, I, you basically tag like each and every material of a built project and it gets loaned out to a project. And then like in the afterlife of that building, or once you raise that structure to the ground, those materials can then go on and kind of up until they kind of hit the end point of their life cycle can be used in something else. Right. So like mm. the way we talk about deconstructing projects mm. versus like demolishing them, um, the yeah. way we think about the life cycle of a material versus a life cycle of a building. There's a lot of work in that space right now. And it, I don't know if like the answer to that is that, is that it must be an organic architecture. You know, mm -hmm. I think like we can still think about deconstruction in other ways. Mm -hmm. Will deconstruction become decomposition? Mm -hmm. when we yeah. biological Maybe architecture? It might make more sense, actually. That's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Potentially. And like all the challenges of deconstruction. Compostable yeah. cities. There was that MoMA PS1 project, right, with, that The Living did, where it was like mushroom bricks. And then when the structure was done, they basically just like disintegrated the bricks back down to organic matter that they could then either like put into the ground or like remake into some kind of brick form. Mm -hmm. um, or burn. I like the idea that we could like throw out our old robot device like into compost or like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, with the, with the like food waste or something. Yeah. Or yeah like, put it in is, your garden. It's like... I like this idea of like thinking of the term bionic as something that could be organic. Organic, yeah. But don't forget yeah. to uh, gut it and grab that gold skeleton for it. <laughs> 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 Pawn it off to the highest bidder, yeah. Yeah. The, the question of, of whether it's alive too, like to me, it just feels like that tradition of like everything from like Mechanical Turk to Frankenstein to whatever that that simulates movement in some way, but like it can't reproduce, like it can't, or, and it can't like alter its own genome or something to adapt to the environment the way like a plant or bacteria can. So it, I don't know. Well, if it could, then I would feel like, oh shit, like that's getting the edge of like what's alive. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know? if you're growing cells, right? What if the heart muscle cells? If you do something, yeah. Like not really connecting it to a, a full organism or something or what we think of as an organism. I yeah, don't know, it's, it's it interesting because like, the cells can, they can be infected, they can, like a lot can happen. Mm -hmm. 
it's interesting because the DNA inside these cells, like normally when you have like a cell, right? Like the DNA inside of the cell has like some sort of notion of the whole, like what this structure looks like when it like forms. In these heart cells, you're having this like uh, stingray, like hybrid Franken animal. The, the notion of the whole that's represented in this DNA inside the cells is not actually what it is in its embedded uh, context, right? Which is a weird animal. It's not what it would become if, it, if you just let it grow uh, normally. Yeah, which is kind of interesting. It's not so, like, there's this concept in architecture called, like, adaptive reuse, which people have been employing for ages and ages and ages, but there was this guy, like, Sam Mockby with Rural Studio, who mm -hmm. famously would make, you know, like, chapels out of, like, windshield screens from cars or, like, mm -hmm. walls out of, like, houses out of, like, car tires and stuff. But this idea of adaptive reuse for bionic systems or for, like, living cells and living materials, organic materials, I think is also kind of interesting. It's like, just because it's a heart muscle, a heart cell does not mean you have to have it operate as a heart, mm -hmm. right, or yeah. grow it as a heart. The reason they, they chose the heart, the heart muscle cells from rat embryos was because those cells lend themselves to being able to contract and expand really easily. And mm -hmm. so they had, like, this embedded kind of kineticism already. Cool. What did it signal like noise? I think it's a signal of like a broader biodigital convergence that we're seeing. And I think I'm, I'm quite excited for that actually, because I think it, we need some new, pardon the pun, new blood in, in, in the digital space. <laughs> new blood in the digital space. Yeah, Fabulous. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I would say the same, some kind of weird biodigital, as Udin said, hybrids seems interesting and like on the radar and exciting and weird and dangerous and worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Same. Also, just, yeah, again, along the lines of thinking of organic materials for infrastructure and other things. And I'm also very interested in this decomposition versus deconstruction or a hybrid of that as um, new rituals. For sure. Yeah. For me, it's like this, yeah, the biomechanical applications that are kind of curious and interesting to me of actually using some of these biological systems to as yeah, like infrastructure or something in a strange future. Sounds really cool. So I'll go signal. So I'll broadcast one later. <laughs>